So a lot of you might know that uh, Boston was settled by English Europeans uh, led by a lawyer named John Winthrop, uh, who got a charter from Charles I of England, the king, for what was called the Massachusetts Bay Colony, right? And there were two purposes of the Massachusetts Bay Colony. There's the one which tends to be emphasized, which is to found a religious commonwealth, right? Away from the eyes of uh, the Church of England. Um, but the second, well, who would guess the second motivation? The second big part of the motivation was profit, right? Um, these people also wanted land. Um, they had dreams of gold and silver based on what they had been hearing had been discovered uh, in South America. Um, and certainly as far as the king was concerned, you know, profit was the major um, motive. Um, so Winthrop uh, and his colonists came in 1630 to the first spot, um, which was in today's Salem, right north of here. Uh, but the conditions weren't good. Uh, people were getting sick and dying. Um, and so uh, Winthrop sets out to find a new spot, comes to the south of where he was in Salem, Salem's north of here, um, to this area, because there were already Englishmen here, okay? There were two in particular, two sort of uh, lone adventurers who we'll hear a little bit more about during the class. Um, William Blackstone, uh, who lived on the peninsula over there, Shamit. Uh, he lived in a bunch of different places, but that, at that time was living in Shamit. Um, and Samuel Maverick, uh, who was living on one of the Boston Harbor Islands. And Winthrop comes down here, he speaks to, um, uh, to Maverick and to Blackstone, um, and decides that this spot right here, so where City Square is and Paul Revere Park, where we're gonna to go to, um, which sat on the tip of the Mishawam Peninsula, was the ideal spot, right? And this was a peninsula, as we're gonna see, so much of Boston is on made land. It's on built land, filled in land. Um, and this was a peninsula who's had a, which a tiny neck um, up in what's today's Sullivan Square, uh, up in Somerville. Um, and Shawmut Peninsula, where Boston is, had a tiny neck um, around what today is, is the Back Bay. Um, so he settles here, right? Um, and they try and spend the summer, but there's no really good water source, right? It's brackish water. The water is making everybody sick. Um, estimates are up to 600 of the 1,500 colonists are dying from dysentery or dysentery. I'm never really sure which one it is. Um, and uh, Blackstone says to Winthrop, hey, bring your people over to the other side of the peninsula, all right? Go come to Shamut. Shamut actually means in the Algonquin language, living fountains. It had a big natural spring with a clean water source. Um, and so Winthrop and the colonists uh, move over there um, right around this time in 1630. You know, even before that, during the summer, people were spreading out, right? There were a lot of colonists and people were spreading out. They were going up the Charles River, up the Mystic River, and founding new settlements, looking for new water sources. Um, but Winthrop takes most people over to Shamut. About, a thir about 30 people remain in Charlestown, right? Winthrop had, I left that out, but Winthrop named the town Charlestown, the place of the first permanent settlement after Charles I, uh, who had given them the charter, right? And they decide to create their new permanent settlement name it Boston, which was the town in England where many of them had come from. Um, and at that point, Charlestown and Boston, they take, they take sort of different trajectories as different towns, right? Um, the uh, uh, Charlestown is actually a separate city 
um, until the 1870s when it's annexed by Boston. Um, and, you know, Boston, of course, comes to overshadow very quickly uh, the significance of Charlestown. Um, but both build wharves, both are seaport towns, um, and, um, uh, and are shaped and are built uh, by the Europeans who settle here. So I think we should walk over to Paul Revere Park now, and we should talk a little bit about what those colonists saw when they got here. So right here, we are now, we're in, on the Mishawam Peninsula, we're in Paul Revere Park, right? We're in the place that uh, the Massachusetts Bay Company, led by John Winthrop, decide to settle and decide to call Charlestown. And it's facing the Shawmut Peninsula. <laughs> now, I mean, so much has been built, right? We, we, can't, we can't tell, right? We have to envision that it was an open peninsula, an open channel, I should say, between two peninsulas, between here, Mishawam, uh, or what was consecrated as Charlestown, and over there, you know, which is today the north end uh, of the city of Boston, which was the tip of um, the Shawmut Peninsula. All right. Now, so what made this area, the um, Mishawam Peninsula and the Shawmut Peninsula, a good place for the colonists of the Massachusetts Bay Company to settle was the fact that people had been here shaping, in the, envi shaping the environment, shaping the land for thousands of years, right? These areas had been cleared of trees, right? Um, by Massachusetts people who planted crops here. They planted uh, beans, they planted corn. Um, there were weirs, fish weirs uh, in the water, right? For catching fish, these were um, fish nets made out of twigs that when the tide would go out, would catch fish, right? Animals knew, like deer knew, to forage at the edge of the areas uh, where that had been cleared, that you know was a sort of a natural way of inviting animals in uh, to hunt them, right? Um, so the people who lived here had already shaped the environment to effectively and efficiently extract its resources to live, right? And to get the food. Um, there was also all sorts of other um, natural resources that that they could survive off of. Shellfish, tons and tons of shellfish, um, natural oyster beds, uh, lobster. Uh, there were seals um, that could be hunted. There were even whales, right, that if they were stuck shallow or they were beached, um, would be hunted uh, and divided up uh, between, the, between the different groups. Um, and this channel between these two peninsulas was a well-traversed channel uh, by Massachusetts people in Mishunash, which were dugout canoes. These were boats made out of burnt logs that would be dug out and floated and paddled very well, and were used to traverse between uh, the harbor islands and the, um, the peninsulas and up uh, the waterways. Uh, this area, the environment itself, had been shaped, right, in order to produce as much abundance as possible, right? Um, the Massachusetts people who lived here primarily lived here in the summer, right? They would fish in the summer, um, especially in the, um, uh, in the harbor islands, and plant crops. That's why the land was, was cleared. Um, and then would move inland through the streams uh, during the winter for, for other hunting grounds. Now, where were they? Well, the contacts between Europeans and um, uh, the people who lived on the coast uh, of the Northeastern, you know, what today is the Northeastern United States and Canada, um, had led to rapid spread of disease, right? Um, and by the time the, Europe, the English 
got to Massachusetts Bay, um, the Massachusetts people had already been devastated by disease. There was a particularly bad pandemic between 1617 and 1619 that reduced the population of the Massachusetts people from the thousands into the hundreds, right? Um, so the Europeans were landing here, like I said, in a place that had been, you know, that, that was still populated by people. They're still here, they still were here, they still are here, right? Um, but were able to colonize it um, because it had been shaped by thousands of years and the, the numbers of those people had been reduced dramatically, right? So what they found when they got here was not silver, it was not gold, right? But it was a physical abundance that allowed them to survive food-wise, right? And what they did when they got here was they set about turning this area, which was marshy and hilly um, and was composed of a bunch of tidal flats and islands, right? into something that would resemble an English or European city, right? Um, surrounded by European style farms that would produce European style agriculture, right? And this is a process that's still taking place. I mean, look right here, right? So they built, uh, they had a natu wonderful natural harbor. Um, so they dredged, they built wharves, uh, they leveled, uh, entire hills to fill in space of marshes um, in which whole new neighborhoods were constructed. When John Winthrop was standing here and he looked out here, right, he looked at three hills, right? Uh, it was called the Tremontane. The, anybody, you people haven't explored, um, or the Trimount. Has anybody explored uh, Boston at all? Been to Tremont Street yet? So there's, a, so there's a central street called Tremont Street, right? Which stems from the fact that there were three hills where we are looking, uh, the Trimontane or the Tremont, three, or the Trimount, I should say. So the colonists named these three hills. Uh, there was Mount Cotton in the east, named after the Reverend John Cotton, their minister. Um, that was leveled. Uh, and, and the earth actually removed to fill in parts of the peninsula. Um, there was Beacon Hill, the highest point, which is still there, um, and the state house is on top of, uh, which we can't see because of all of the other construction. Um, and the farthest point was Mount Hordom, and that's fairly self-explanatory for what went on there. Um, but that was also leveled and used to fill in parts of the peninsula. Both the people who lived here beforehand and the colonists shaped this environment, right? They shaped their surroundings, they shaped their places, but in very different ways for very different purposes, right? For the Massachusetts people, um, this was a place to hunt, to fish, to grow crops, right? And they were part of a broader economy of different peoples, different Algonquin people in, in the region. Um, for the colonists, right, this was about creating a European city, creating a commonwealth, right? And eventually, as we'll learn, even a city-state and arguably an empire, right? And they set about turning this, the Shamut Peninsula, right, into a European city right, that would be protected, that would be able to have uh, big ships, and that would be surrounded by farms that could feed it, right? And this transition is still going on today and is a big part of what we're gonna learn in this class. One thing I was gonna ask is, were there multiple different like groups of natives here, or was it mainly just one tribe or like? So yeah, there were multiple different groups. This is not my area specialty, and we are going to learn more about it. But um, from what I understand, uh, the main language group and the main sort of larger uh, group was the Algonquin people, right? But within those people, there were many different groups living here. Um, right here was the Massachusetts people, 
right? South of here with the Pequot people um, uh, in around Cape Cod, there was the Mashpee and the Wampanoag people. And I actually have to be careful to stop saying there was because it's really a, a major concern of native people who live here today to say, you know, we're still here, right? We should have recognition. There are thousands of people from these tribes who are still residing in Massachusetts um, saying, you know, we did more than just give our name to this place. We should be acknowledged. Um, and so they, and they are still here. So we're here at the Charlestown Navy Yard. And this location was chosen by the colon colonists, um, both the uh, Mishawam and Shamut Peninsula, specifically because of the protected harbor uh, and the ability to dredge it and build wharves and bring in large ships, right? Uh, and when Charlestown and Boston became separate cities, they, they were both seaport towns. Um, uh, they both had their wharves. A lot of the shipbuilding was done in Boston. It was a much more uh, important city. Uh, until 1800, when the new United States needed to build a navy, uh, they built them in the North End, and the USS Constitution, they started to build in 1793 in the North End. Um, it fought in the war, war of 1812, where the legend is British cannonballs bounced off of its hull, giving it the name Old Ironsides. Um, it is not, in, in fact, made of iron or paneled in iron. It's just really strong wood. So the Charlestown Navy Yard operated between 1800 and 1974, um, building US naval warships. Um, and it was actually in 1895 when the boat was, excuse me, ship um, was being used as a barracks, um, not in Boston, uh, in New Hampshire, I believe, uh, that John Fitzgerald, John Honey Fitz Fitzgerald, the grandfather of JFK, who was a congressman, um, raised the money in Congress or extracted the money from Congress to bring the USS Constitution back to the Charlestown Navy Yard. Um, it was, like I said, it wasn't built here, it was built in the North End, but to house it at the Charlestown Navy Yard, to restore it, to preserve it, um, and to keep its commission, and it's still a commissioned naval warship, um, I believe the oldest or lang la longest standing um, uh, commissioned naval warship. The USS Constitution Museum is over there, but the ship itself is not a museum. Um, it is captained by uh, a member of the Navy um, who's commissioned uh, to do so. But Honey Fitz's goal was, of course, um, both to preserve uh, a little bit of American history, to create a tourist attraction uh, here in Charlestown, and also, as is often the case of Massachusetts politicians, and, and we'll talk about this again when we talk about the Bunker Hill Monument, um, to highlight the role of Massachusetts in the building of the United States um, and the revolution um, itself. Um, so like I said, the, the Naval Yard was a working Naval Yard between uh, 1800 and 1974. Uh, it was a major employer uh, and a major employer for Charlestown, but not just for Charlestown, for uh, people around uh, in different parts of Boston. Um, and in particular, it was a place that African-Americans could get jobs working. Boston wasn't as significant a destination for African-Americans moving from the South to the North to look for jobs and a better lifestyle, not as significant as New York or Chicago or Los Angeles. Um, but it did have its own migration. It was a significant, um, um, uh, a significant center. Uh, and the population went from uh, about 2,000 uh, African-Americans in Boston uh, in 1900 to over 50,000 uh, by the 1950s. 
Um, and you know, one of the reasons why Boston might not have been a very inviting place um, is because, like I said, people were moving for jobs, and this was a place um, that uh, it was very difficult for blacks to get jobs. There was an enormous amount of discrimination, um, and also um, the city politics were, was very conservative, um, very, I guess you could say, tribally based. Um, the patronage worked that way, um, and there was a lot of work to keep African Americans out of jobs. Um, but the Naval Yard was a place where um, African American men and women worked in significant numbers. Um, it's hard to get uh, precise figures. Um, there's only one year in which we do have precise figures. It was because it was during World War II, um, and the government was um, uh, did some sort of cens. Uh, I mean, I don't know. Census did some sort of count, um, and there were over two. In 1943, there were over 2,000 um, African Americans from Boston working in Charlestown Navy Yard. Um, now that is, there were 47,000 workers in the yard. So it's, it was still a small minority of workers um, in the yard, um, but it was a very significant percentage of employment for African-Americans in the city. Um, it was an important employer. Um, and like I said, um, uh, both black men and women did a variety of jobs here, um, especially um, uh, technical jobs that um, many black men brought uh, skills up from the South in, in blacksmithing and shipbuilding. Um, but women also did a range of jobs, uh, and again, especially during World War II. And black women at the Charlestown Navy Yard also played an important ro role in fighting workplace discrimination. Um, during the war in 1941, um, FDR passed by an executive order, a law banning uh, discrimination, racial dis racially based discrimination in defense industries. Um, of course, this was a self-interested effort to get absolutely everybody working towards building and uh, working in the defense uh, industry. But African-Americans themselves took it very seriously and filed complaints with the commission that he established to enforce these rules. These rules. Um, so we have record of numerous complaints, especially by African American women, because this was, of course, during World War uh, World War II, um, when everyone was being mobilized, being intentionally segregated within the Navy Yard, um, and also um, being replaced in their jobs unfairly. African American women and Jewish women uh, by Irish women. Um, who they claimed um, uh, um, you know, were not as qualified or that they'd been unfairly um, replaced. Now, they weren't for the most part successful. Um, they, they teamed up with the local NAACP um, and uh, they advocated um, you know, as powerfully as they could um, for their rights to employment, but seven eighths of the cases uh, were dismissed. Um, so it was both uh, sort of the earliest opportunity that African American women uh, took to fight against discrimination in, in employment, um, but also represented, you know, to a certain degree, the toothlessness of these laws um, and how even the defense industry could continue to get around them and to continue to discriminate. Anybody have any questions? All right, so let's head to the Bunker Hill Monument. Charlestown, this neighborhood was primarily a Yankee Protestant neighborhood. Um, and that's who built much of the houses in the early and mid 1800s. And then what starts happening in the 1830s? Does anybody know? It's important for Boston. Not to put you on the spot. <laughs> the Irish start coming in large numbers. Uh, and um, there's a large Irish Catholic migration um, that becomes even more uh, significant in the 1840s. 
And they start moving into these houses. Um, there's tension between uh, working class Protestants and, and uh, working class uh, Catholics, um, which we'll talk a little bit more about um, in a bit. Um, but they start living in these houses that were built by the uh, Protestant uh, uh, Yankees um, to the extent by, that by 1910, the neighborhood is over 90% Irish Catholic. Um, it's basically an entirely Irish ethnic enclave within the city. So I want to take you guys to the front just so you can see the full height of the monument from below. What hill are we on? Hunter Hill. We're actually on Breed's Hill. We're on the site of, uh, of the Bunker Hill Monument, um, but it was actually built on Breed's Hill because um, despite the American militia being told uh, to fortify Bunker Hill, this was actually a better spot. Um, so they fortified Breed's Hill um, and hence the confusion that the Battle of uh, Bunker Hill was actually fought at Breed's Hill and a little bit further down the hill itself. Um, so what was going on when the Battle of Bunker Hill was fought um, was that General Gage, who was both the governor of, uh, governor of Boston, you know, appointed by the king, the um, American militias who were moving towards the idea of an independent state had set up parallel governments, essentially, right? And soon before the Battle of Bunker Hill, right, there were the famous battles of Lexington and Concord in which the militias were, where people were coming in from all of the surrounding towns of Boston, right, were, were trying to, keep the British in Boston itself, right? They were trying to prevent the British troops from going west, um, going into Cambridge and Somerville, uh, and then further west along the Charles. Uh, and they were trying to um, uh, trap them in Boston on the Shawmut Peninsula on the other side. And so there was word that General Gage was going to attack Charlestown, where there were uh, American militia troops. They were told to fortify Bunker Hill. Uh, they fortified uh, Breed's Hill. Um, and they led a heroic defense uh, of Charlestown. Um, they had the high ground, as you can see. Um, they repelled wave of professionally trained British troops after wave. Um, the British suffered about 900 uh, casualties to a much smaller amount um, for the Americans, but they lost, right? They withdrew across to Cambridge to fight another day. So even though they lost this battle, within Massachusetts history, it became a very important touchstone um, to emphasize the sacrifice of Massachusetts and its necessary role in the revolution itself, right? because they had fought this battle, because they had uh, extracted such a cost on the British troops, um, they were able to win other battles and ultimately um, the Revolutionary War. In the early period of the state, in the 1800s, there was more desire among private Massachusetts citizens to erect a monument uh, to this battle that would showcase um, the sacrifice and the valor of Massachusetts militiamen, and private association formed uh, to build it. Um, the money was raised uh, overwhelmingly privately um, through fundraising in children's schools, through charity events, um, and I, I believe the majority of the money came actually through, through women's groups um, who uh, organized charity events um, to pay for the construction uh, of the monument. The cornerstone was laid in 1825, um, but because they repeatedly ran out of money, uh, it took 18 years to build. Um, the, first, uh, the first railway in the United States was built 
specifically to bring granite from quarries and quinzies south of here uh, up to the site of the monument uh, and to construct it. Um, but, you know, it was controversial even when it was first built. At the opening, um, John Quincy Adams, who had lived, of course, through the events and had been president, he refused to attend uh, because John Tyler, the president at the time, uh, would be there with his cabinet of slaveholders. But I also want to talk about um, a later controversy at this site um, that was also about sacrifice, also about uh, memorialization, um, and tells us something about how the meaning of monuments can change over time, um, and how monuments themselves have their own history. Um, and this is, you know, it's funny because this is something that um, this summer, as many more monuments in the United States have come into question for their value, um, or what to do with them if they're problematic, um, uh, is a very pertinent uh, question. Now, in Charlestown, uh, between the 1970s and the 1990s, um, this, the neighborhood was uh, predominantly Irish um, still. It was predominantly working class. As we know, the Navy Yard uh, closed in 1974. Um, these were tough times. Um, there were a lot of gangs. There was unemployment. Um, there was a high poverty rate. About a quarter of Charlestown's 15,000 residents in the 1970s lived under the poverty line. Um, and it had a very high murder rate for a really a one mile long small neighborhood uh, of 15,000 people. The murders were primarily linked to gangs and the gangs imposed a code of silence um, that made it very difficult to impossible for the police to investigate or to prosecute the murders. So in the 1990s, um, a support group for mothers whose sons had been murdered in gang violence formed called Charlestown after, um, after murder. This support group was largely out of the limelight um, until a film came out in 1998 called Monument Avenue. Um, the star Dennis Leary and Martin Sheen um, was a crime movie focused in Charlestown that, um, that highlighted the poverty, the gangs, the code of silence. Um, and people in Charlestown reacted. Um, they felt very strongly that the movie gave an unfair impression, um, an unfair impression of the neighborhood um, and stereotyped it, and, and it wasn't um, fair. Um, and at the same time, uh, Jill Medvedal from the Institute for Contemporary Art in Boston hired um, Krzysztof Wodiczka, who is a, um, uh, an artist who uh, appropriates monuments and creates new exhibits out of them through projection to collaborate with the, um, uh, the, with the mothers to create an art installation and monument to their children that would be displayed on the monument itself. The mothers had actually been very wary about this. Um, they, like I said, this was really a private support group um, not a public advocacy group, um, and the code of silence still reigned in Charlestown, uh, although uh, many of these mothers had been fighting it. Um, but Vadichka showed them his previous work. Um, he had actually uh, did a project, another project in Boston, the Boston Civil War uh, Sailors and Soldiers Monument, where he projected images of, of the homeless of Boston on it. And they were convinced that he would do justice to their cause. Vodichko wanted that, um, uh, that the mothers would be above and that the images would be projected uh, ab above the viewer. And so he filmed from the point of view of the viewer who would be at the base of the monument. Um, and as part of this exhibit, 
These images were projected with, in the background, on loudspeakers, the interviews of the mothers talking about their murdered children. Now, this was incredibly controversial. On the opening night, um, Jim Conway, who runs the, the, bunker, the annual Bunker Hill Day every June 15th and is involved in local Charlestown uh, boosting, um, accosted Jill Medvedow, the, the director of the ICA, publicly and accused her of soiling sacred ground. It's really interesting, right? Even the use of the term sacred ground is interesting, right? Because for these mothers, this was sacred ground, right? Their sons had been murdered here, right? They themselves saw this as a place representing you know, their own sacrifice. And so in a lot of ways, it was a brilliant exhibit, challenging the gendered motif of a victory monument, uh, which is, of course, uh, evocative of uh, strength in a very masculine way, uh, and inverting it and putting the mother's pain on it, right? Um, and, and it really sort of started a conversation within, within the city and among uh, public historians um, and people talking about public art in the city um, about how monuments can be appropriated to change their meaning, right? Um, how monuments' meanings change over time um, and how the monuments themselves have their own history. Any questions? Yeah. yeah. When did you say this was again? This was 1998. Okay. Oh, that would be Yeah, no, it was not long ago. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So our last destination, we're going to walk to the backside uh, of Bunker Hill um, and walk down to the Bunker Hill projects and talk a bit about the history of um, continued tensions in the neighborhood. Um, and how the neighborhood has changed from a different perspective from the projects looking up at Bunker Hill. Uh, Reed's Hill, Bunker Hill Monument, yeah. What caused the formation of all the gangs in this area? Was there something specific? Yeah, so, I mean, youth unemployment, right? Um, I think that that, that, was the, um, that was the big issue. Um, people were in trades and in industry in a time in which um, those trades and industries were declining. There was greater unemployment. There was um, a higher high school dropout rate due to resistance to desegregation, which is often known as busing. Talk about it later in the, um, in the class, but you know, like others, I am loath to say resistance to busing because it obscures the real issue, which was resistance to integration, right? Um, but there's no doubt that um, resistance to integration within the schools led to a higher dropout rate um, as these schools were integrated um, in the city of Boston. Uh, and that's one of the things we'll talk about um, down at the projects. Um, but um, it really, I think that the declining um, the declining fortunes uh, of the people who lived here um, and organized crime as well. Um, there were two kinds of gangs, of course. The, the gangs of people hanging out outside the pizza place and, and the gangs that actually ran things. Um, and there was a lot of organized crime uh, as well. Um, we'll talk about that on the other side. So we're now on Monument Street on the east side of Charlestown, uh, down the hill from uh, the Bunker Hill Monument, um, very close to all of these uh, lovely, pristine 19th century homes um, in the Bunker Hill housing, a public housing project. And this was a site of um, much of the resistance to integration of Charlestown High School down the street. Um, it was an Irish and white housing project uh, until it was integrated, forcibly integrated, although ultimately peacefully, uh, in 1984. Uh, and it was a site of really one of the most 
notorious uh, uh, attacks um, or racially motivated crimes, although it was never, um, never acknowledged as such, uh, of the late 1970s. September 28th, 1979, Charlestown High School was playing Jamaica Plain High School, um, a high school that had integrated um, through busing, um, and a football team that was both black and white. Um, Jamaica Plain High School was up at the half, and uh, the players were congregating around their coach in the end zone at halftime. Suddenly, Daryl Williams, one of their receivers, was shot in the spine and instantly became paralyzed from the neck down uh, for life. The shot was traced to three teenagers who fired it from the roof of 84 Monument Street in these projects. These three, um, these three teenagers uh, were arrested. Um, they denied that it was racially motivated. Um, one of them was a minor and not charged. Um, the two of them uh, were charged and eventually pled guilty uh, to assault and battery with a deadly weapon. Um, but they denied that the crime was racially motivated. Um, they claimed that they were just playing around with a gun in the projects like everybody did. Um, and the police and the city largely, when I say the city, the city government, largely accepted this uh, explanation. Of course, nobody else did. <laughs> um, neither the whites nor the blacks in the cities um, uh, understood it as anything other than a racially motivated attack um, after a period of intense um, tension due to the integration of the schools. Now, Darrell Williams, despite, despite being uh, paralyzed from the neck down, um, became uh, an advocate for tolerance, an advocate for forgiveness and coexistence, a public speaker. He ultimately received uh, a BA from Northeastern. And like I said, um, two of these um, uh, late teens went to prison. Now, I read a... Um, uh, I read an interview that was done in 1980 um, with one of them, Stephen McGonigal, and a Washington Post uh, reporter who went to visit him in prison to ask him about the motivation for the crime. And again, he denied that this was racially motivated. He denied that he had been aiming at Williams or, uh, or the JP football players, despite, you know, hitting hitting Williams uh, from 304 meters away in the back of the neck. Um, but he did openly talk about the hostility against blacks in the neighborhood. He openly said that, yes, of course, you know, we're all in gangs. And part of that is keeping blacks out of the neighborhood, um, that blacks who come into the neighborhood are subject um, to, to violence, to beating. He said it, it, it just depends on, on, on people's mood, you know? <laughs> if they're in a good mood, they'll just beat them up. Uh, if they're in a bad mood, maybe it'll be something worse. Um, so he didn't, he didn't concede to this particular crime, um, but did concede, of course, to participation in violence against blacks to keep blacks out of the neighborhood. And the reporter's perspective, I think, reflected much of the perspective at the time, which was to seek to see the complexities of the white experience, right? To see this as a product of a lack of opportunities, of um, he was a high school dropout because he didn't want to be bused to Roxbury, so uh, of, of bad government policy and and a lack of opportunities and gangs and poverty, right? 24% uh, uh, below the poverty line um, and unemployment, et cetera. Um, and to view this you know, in, a, in a complex way um, that um, I don't think, uh, uh, that is not necessarily ex extended to um, African Americans who are incarcerated. Um, and one of the interesting things that that McGonagall said when he was interviewed 
and asked, you know, well, what is it about blacks in the neighborhood that you don't want? Like, wh what are you so afraid of? And his answer was, well, they bring in low crime. And when I read this, I thought to myself, that doesn't make sense. Well, why would that be a problem if they're bringing low crime? But then he clarified what he meant by low crime. Any of you might guess? So low crime, he gave examples of muggings and purse snatching, right? Not like robbing banks, armored cars, you know, the kinds of things that townies in Charlestown were famous for, right? Uh, and, and McGonagall said this, you know, sometimes there are bank robberies or sometimes there's a fight and somebody gets stabbed, but nobody wants these sort of muggings, you know, that he claimed were associated with blacks um, uh, and that were uh, low crime. And you know, I, I think like to a certain to, to a certain degree, um, the media, both in the coverage of the busing crisis, which we'll get into uh, later in the semester, um, um, but also in in the movies that um, you know that 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 have been produced since um, and since things have improved, you know, films like uh, like The Town, right, which is set in Charlestown. Um, there's a, a new show, actually, newish Showtime show, that I think is quite good, called City on a Hill. But then, you know, films about other Irish enclave neighborhoods in the city, most of them having to do with crime, The Departed, Mystic River, you know, even Goodwill Hunting. They depict these neighborhoods as being their neighborhoods, right? They t depict these neighborhoods as being you know, sort of legitimately exclusive, right? Um, and, you know, as being their sort of their own insular world uh, in which, you know, it's always been this way and, and it always should be this way. Um, when, of course, as we know, it wasn't always this way uh, and it, all, it won't always be this way, right? The whole history of the city is, is people changing, right? The city changing, people changing. So these, these Irish ethnic neighborhoods are often depicted um, in film, in television, as sort of permanent, as theirs, right? In the busing crisis itself, much of this was reinforced by the national news media when they were covering uh, the, the riots and the resistance to integration of the schools in Charlestown and Southie, South Boston, which we'll get to later, that you just hear the same sentences over and over again. The, the, Irish, the Irish working class neighborhood of Charlestown, the Irish working class neighborhood of uh, South Boston, right? That is 15,000 people, 90 something percent Irish, and so on and so forth. It was presented from their perspective that it is their neighborhood and people who come in are invading it. And you know, there's an interesting parallel, of course, to when the Irish themselves, the Catholics themselves came into Charlestown. Um, because in the 1830s and the 1840s, working class Protestants and more middle class sort of Yankee patrician types deeply resisted Catholics moving into their neighborhoods. They associated them with popery, with strange rituals, uh, idolatry. Um, they assumed that their loyalty to the Pope was greater than to that of the Republic. Um, and there were frequent scuffles, brawls, houses being attacked, um, to the point that in 1834, the Ursuline convent uh, was burned to the ground by a mob that included uh, bricklayers and members of the Char Charlestown Voluntary uh, Fire Brigade. Um, there had been rumors that uh, nuns were being abused in, you know, uh, uh, popish uh, rituals. But really this was, of course, about the resistance to Catholics in the neighborhood. This was actually in Somerville. It was Charlestown at the time. Today it's technically Somerville. But of course, at the time, they saw it as Charlestown, and we're talking about Catholics um, in Charlestown. The other interesting thing about these Ursuline convent riots was that the sisters also ran a school, a very good school, where 
much of the Protestant elite of the city sent their daughters to be educated. So it was also an attack on cooperation, right? It was an attack on tolerance. Now, of course, you know, ultimately this failed, right? Um, the Protestant for the, Protestants, for the most part, uh, moved out. Um, the Catholics, for the most part, moved in. This does become an Irish Catholic neighborhood. Like I said before, it's, it's, it's over 90% uh, Irish uh, by 1910. But, you know, the idea that this is permanent or that, you know, that, um, uh, um, that this is any single group's neighborhood, of course, is going to be challenged over time. The sort of lesson of the Ursuline convent and the parallels um, to the violence against Daryl Walker and resistance of, to integration is that you know, the Protestants were losing, were fighting a losing battle against the Catholics in the 19th century. Um, ultimately, uh, the whites uh, were fighting a losing battle uh, against integration by uh, African Americans and, and others as well. Um, because that's the city itself, right? Neighborhoods aren't owned by groups. They change, right? And they change for reasons beyond any group or individual's control. Right? So now it's changing because um, so now it's changing because it's simply becoming unaffordable for most people. Charlestown's being integrated into the city itself. It's so close to Boston. It's so close to, to, to downtown. Um, it's become younger. It's become trendier. It's become more diverse. But it's also become impossible for those who are from here to buy a house unless it's inherited or were bought before the 1990s when prices um, skyrocketed. So I guess that's sort of the story that I want to tell about Charlestown, that like every neighborhood in Boston, uh, it's shaped by the people who, who literally construct and build the environment, right? But also circulate, change. Nothing's permanent. No one owns these neighborhoods, right? Any sense of permanence, even if it develops over uh, 80 or 90 years is, is ultimately subject to uh, powers beyond anyone's control um, having to do with the development of the city. The city has a life of its own.